What an amazing miracle. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but apparently we are live right now, and we have been for a few minutes. Thank you, Owen, for letting me know, because uh, we thought we weren't, and we kind of are, and gosh, you can tell uh, how new this platform is to us, but we're so thankful. My name's Father Allen. We're sorry we're running a little bit late getting started. We didn't think we had a connection, and we do. What a, a wonderful blessing that is. On this, the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany, welcome. Welcome wherever you are tuning in from. Thank you so much to Steve, uh, our bell ringer today, and our usher to James, who's our organist, of course. Uh, Nathaniel, our live stream worker. Dan, you remain in our prayers, dear friend, uh, who's with his family on the passing of his beautiful mama. Uh, thank you, William, for being our assistant today as well, and for Mark for being among us. And Rita's back in the hall. She's going to be our deacon today. We also had a glitch this morning, uh, last night I understood, on our Pancake Supper. That is happening. We're doing that fundraiser um, this coming Tuesday. Uh, but the best way to order your box, Mardi Gras in a box, is to check your email for one that we just sent out. It's a resend. Um, and it's an email that will go directly to Shirley so that she knows who and how many to prepare for. Inside that box, you'll have everything you need to do Mardi Gras at home. It'll have bacon and, 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 and pancake mix and, and wonderful local honey and, and toppings for all of those things, plus uh, beads and Mardi Gras decorations, as well as a container of ashes for our Ash Wednesday service and a bulletin, uh, so that each family has everything they need to celebrate Mardi Gras and Shrove Tuesday at home, um, and also uh, the stuff that they're going to need for our Ash Wednesday service, a single service this week, Wednesday at 6 p.m., those are the big announcements for us, uh, but let's get to worship, shall we? We're so glad that you are here with us this morning. Welcome. God bless you. We're going to uh, hear a prelude, and then we're going to ring that bell, and we'll get going.
Thank you so much, James, for that beautiful prelude. Our worship continues on this, the last Sunday after the Feast of the Epiphany in your bulletins. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, before who, before the passion of your only begotten Son, revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. First reading, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah and Elisha, <clears throat> stay, here for, stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out, of, came out to see Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your, you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were in Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elisha, Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to, to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went, went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed Elijah's, and Elijah said to Elisha, <clears throat> tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father. The chariots of Israel and its horsemen, excuse me, 
but when he could no longer see him, he grasped, sorry, his own clothes and tore him into pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading, Second Corinthians four, chapter four, three through six. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of their this world has blinded their minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is, in the <clears throat> who is in the image of God, for we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Christ, for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge to Sorry, to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mark, thank you so much for reading for us today. Would you please stand as you are able for the gospel? The holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Thank you so much, Rita. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. Transfiguration is one of my favorite gospel stories because it shows us what happens when we encounter the unconditional, affirming love of God? 
All three synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, share this story, which lends credibility to its historicity, but also significant gravity to its importance. There are lots of dimensions to this amazing story. But it is a particular word that you heard Rita read in Mark's gospel, which he uses for the effect that the transfiguration has on Jesus that I would like to unpack for us this morning because it is connected. It is connected to the season in which we find ourselves. It is even connected to this day and to love. That word that Mark uses, which describes how Jesus' face and his clothing shone, that Greek word is stilbanta. Say stilbanta. Stilbanta. Stilbanta, this word, it occurs only once in all of Scripture. Matthew uses it to describe the radiance, the radiance of what happens to Jesus at the transfiguration, his clothes and his face. Certainly the gospel writers didn't have a properly descriptive word to do this radiance justice because each of the three gospels is forced to use an analogy. It defies definition for us as well. Crisper than the whitest cotton could ever be bleached on a cool spring day radiant like a new sun, shining brighter even if it's possible than light. All three Gospels, however, use the exact same word for the process. They all use transfigured here. And this word we do understand. We see it all the time. The word they all use, transfigured in the Greek, is metamorphosis. We understand this. It's familiar to us because it's the same thing that happens to a caterpillar when it becomes a butterfly. It's the same thing that happens to a tadpole when it becomes a frog. An elemental change from the thing that it was and to the thing that it is intended to be. Metamorphosis is about a, as natural a giant occurrence as we can possibly get in our world. That part we understand. But I think Matthew's stillbanta is helpful here for some of the same reasons. Because I believe we have seen and we have experienced when it gets right down to it something similar about this transfiguring radiance. I want to share with you a story, a story that I think illustrates this point well and falls in line with the occasion today. On the day that she was married, she finally thought herself beautiful. Truly beautiful. Yes, it was the amazing white dress and the veil and the beautiful train and the look, the look in her father's eyes. And yes, yes, it was also family and friends from far and wide and the look that they gave to her. But more than that, more than that, it was that someone else fought her the most beautiful girl, the most beautiful girl in the world. He really did. You could see it in his eyes, the way he looked at her. And she knew. She knew from that look that it was true. And after the service, as she pirouetted in front of the giant hallway mirror, in the dress that she had dreamed about wearing from the moment she was a little girl, she had to admit it was true. She was incredibly beautiful, inside and out too. 
And since that moment, her life had been good, not just good, beautifully good. Maybe about as close to perfect as she had ever imagined. Except she had to admit for the beauty part. After the wedding and the honeymoon, their lives began to pick up speed. And before she knew it, another prayer was answered. And the first of two children was born. And then just two years later, another little one. For her and her husband, all of their attention shifted to the children. To those stumbling, heartwarming, and achingly beautiful, wonderful children. And between the needs of those children and the needs of their home and the needs of a young marriage, she just forgot, honestly, about being beautiful. The hardship of birthing two children was obvious to her and nursing and caring for them too. Childbirth had changed the way she looked and furthermore, before all of that, she used to love to walk and to exercise and yoga, brisk afternoon workouts with the dog. She, she used to be, she thought, immune to the effects of gravity. And then came the diapers and the late night feedings and the lack of sleep for both she and her husband. And while the children, you might say, were spit and polished, mocked and stitched, shining and bright, at times, she thought the cost was trading silk, as it's known for fleece. Trading silver for sippy cups. Trading, you might say, their beauty for hers. Yes, that was it. The attention she used to be able to devote to her hair and to her makeup, to her exercise, to her wardrobe, now, now she devoted to them to their health, to their clothing, to their exercise, to their diet. It dawned on her one day they had switched places. But in fact, that's actually what she wanted anyway. She didn't think twice about trading what she considered her beauty for theirs. But then one day, then one day, just a short while ago, now six years, six years since that wedding day, thinking of how time flies with just a tinge of regret for the way that she used to be. As she combed the older girl's hair and got the younger girl's clothes ready for the day, scrambling to get ready, wondering how the run in her stockings got there and where was that Kleenex box, she felt it. She felt it as sure as I am speaking with you this morning, that, that look, the gaze. And as she looked in the mirror at the young one whose hair she was combing, she noticed out of the corner of her eye. In the corner of that mirror, her husband in the doorway looking at her. And his reflection in that mirror stopped her heart because it may have been six years and two children and lots of hard work and care and feeding and late nights but she knew that look as sure as anything and she didn't know how long she'd been he'd been watching her get the children ready trying to get herself ready at the same time but long enough to realize it was the same look and he was. There he was in the doorway looking at her in the exact same way that he did that day six years ago when she walked down the aisle. And here's where it got significantly more powerful because she noticed almost simultaneously the children noticing her, noticing him. And friends, six years collapsed in that moment into eternity as she noticed now not one, but three pairs of eyes looking at her exactly the same way as that day on her wedding. 
The children had the same eyes as their father. It was adoration, just short of perfect love as much as two or three or four people could ever feel one for another. And she realized that she was still, in fact, more so, incredibly beautiful. For now the children were looking at her the same way too. Still the most beautiful girl in the world. She had to admit it was still true. She was still incredibly beautiful inside and out too. This, my friends, is what I think Mark means when he says still bonta. That the radiance with which Jesus shone, with which he was transfigured, is still bonta. We have seen it. Chances are you have encountered it too. We should be asking ourselves, why now? Why this gospel? Why in this place? Why transfigured? Why still Bonta? Why Peter, James, and John? Maybe it was because they just left such a dark valley and heard that their Messiah would be killed. Maybe it's because they felt that they weren't at all sure whether God's plan was going to work out if it had to look like this. Maybe, maybe it's because they were all realizing just what happens when we encounter the transfiguring love of God. Certainly it's all of those. But I think it's also because when we allow our vulnerable selves to reflect the unconditional love of our spouses, our children, our dearest friends, we glow. We become radiant. When we accept the guileless and innocent love of our young children, the heartfelt, hard-fought love of our spouses, our parents, and our closest of friends, it has a way of being reflected in us as Stilbanta. Oh, but when we hear and feel this same, except even more, if that can be said, powerful and unconditional love from God himself, it's transfiguring. Of course it would be. How could it not? Chances are this morning, you have witnessed times like these and moments like these. Maybe you recall them in your own wedding, in your own spouse, in your own children. I know I have. But chances are you've seen it in the way that a young girl can look at her daddy at just the right moment. Or the way a young boy gazes adoringly at his mother. For my part, I can affirm that I have witnessed it dozens of times, most poignantly in that dance that comes right at the 50th wedding anniversary celebration. The way, for instance, that Jug looked into Nancy's eyes. The way my own father looked at my mother on their 50th and countless other individuals chances are watching this right now we've also seen it we know in birthday parties of young children in the way that parents look at their sons and their daughters and we've seen it when young lovers fall head over heels one for another it's reflected radiant, unconditional, transfiguring beauty. We are reminded today, on Valentine's Day, that it is still Bonta that Jesus encounters. And what is true for Christ is ultimately true for each and every single one of us who are made in his image. 
what God does for Christ, Christ intends to do for each and every single one of us. As today, ironically Valentine's, St. Valentine's Day of all days, we are reminded by our Savior that still Bonta is for each and every single one of us. It is true for Helen and for Edith. It's equally true for Mary and Leslie and Kathleen and Evie and Susan and Rita and Kay. And it is true for Jack and Mark and Gary and William and David and Paul and James as well. It is the true image of how and who we are. And it is in every single one of us. When we hear, you are my beloved child. You might say in closing that each of us has this desire when we have children, do we not? Especially when they're teenagers. And we look at them and say, I wish, I wish, I pray that you would see yourself the way that I do. Why would that not be exactly God's wish as well? My prayer for each and every single one of us today as we enter into this season of Lent, that we would be asking ourselves, are we able to see with the eyes that God uses to see us? For if we are, we will see us as we truly are, beautiful, inside and out. Silbanta. Amen. And now, seated or kneeling as you are able, let us pray the prayer our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. God has called us out of darkness into the glorious light of the sun. Let us therefore pray for those who do not yet know the light, and for all those in need of our prayers, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the church, its ministry to the world, for all bishops and clergy, for the um, ministries, and for all those who bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for all those in authority, and for and for an end of war and oppression, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For those who have not heard the good news of salvation, for those who have heard but have not believed, and for those who have forsaken their faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the lonely and the dis, dis, the destitute, for the victims of injustice and discrimination for the unloved and the forgotten, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For the sick in body, mind, and spirit, for the hungry and the homeless, for the dying and the, uh, be, uh, and the be, be, be raved, uh, for all those in the need of prayers, especially Diana, Chris, Chance, Barbara, Kevin, Deanie, B, Brenda, Ruth, Timmy, Faye, Eddie, Larry, let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, hear our prayer. In this epiphany season, for the blessing upon our homes and families, for the light of your love to overcome division and the strength to see the strength to see and reflect that light those around us let us pray to the Lord Lord hear our prayer for the saints who have gone before us in the faith and are now at rest and for all the saints on earth who surround us in great fellowship with love let us pray to the Lord Lord Lord, hear our prayer loving God Hear the prayers of your faithful people and guide our thoughts and actions so that your will may be done and your name glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we have confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of his Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. So I had this homily prepared earlier in the week because we do our Bible study every week, Garris Bible study with staff, and, and, and it was all about how the God of the mountain, that's the God in the valleys too, is the same Lord with us through it all. But as we got closer in the week, got closer to a beautiful wedding, one of our own, Greg Wellstead, uh, married his beautiful, beautiful Nancy just this past Saturday. And Rita and I had the great occasion with a couple other members, this little COVID safe thing down on Jekyll Island. And the look, the look in Greg's eyes when they danced and, and as they stood and proclaimed their vows and the looks in Nancy's eyes to him made me realize this Valentine's, we just needed to hear that. You 
needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. That's still Bonta, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May it go with you, be with you, and remain with you always. Amen. Would you please stand as you are able? And now, God's precious, beloved, beautiful children, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs> Thank you, holy people, for joining us on what was a romp through so many different emotions and, and opportunities. God bless you, handsome, amazing men, lions of the church. God bless you, beautiful, holy women of the church. Still Bonta, stay safe. We'll see you soon. <laughs>